This is Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Our theme in Colossians is the preeminence and sufficiency of Christ in all things. Uh, quiz from last week. True or false, God's plan for man's redemption uh, was uh, that God would create a special being who would be called Jesus, who would take on human form. He would make it possible for men to work their way into a good relationship with God by repenting of their sins and being baptized with water and doing good deeds, which would pay the penalty for their sins. That's absolutely false. That's total heresy. Uh, Jesus Christ was not created uh, in that way. Uh, Jesus Christ is God. And the only way for man, man cannot do any good works to get into a good relationship with with uh, God. And uh, being baptized with water has absolutely nothing to do with your uh, being justified before God. Uh, doing all the good deeds that you could ever do in your entire life would never pay the penalty for your sins. But there are a lot of people that believe various elements of this. And, and in fact, they don't believe that Jesus was even God. And these are horrible, horrible things that are taught uh, to various people and denominations in the church today. So uh, that's totally false teaching. True or false, Jesus is the eternal God-man by the decision of the Godhead, and he did everything that was necessary to reconcile men to God through the blood of his cross. And that's absolutely true. That's the total uh, correct teaching uh, about salvation. True or false, after the rapture and Bema Seat judgment, Jesus will place his bride, the church, right by his side to present them in their glorified bodies to his Father and the attending angels in heaven. True. Just think of a, a regular wedding that you see today. Uh, the man and wife uh, are presented to the witnesses uh, after the marriage ceremony, and uh, they're, they're there in all their glory. Everybody gets to see that and all smiles and they're they, uh, they look upon them, and uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful picture. Marriage is a beautiful picture of what happens when Jesus presents his bride to the Father and to the uh, angels. Those who do not learn sound doctrine will be taught the doctrine of demons. And there's, just, there's only two, two sets of doctrine. There's, there's sound doctrine, apostolic doctrine, and there's the doctrine of demons. They're not going to know they're deceived. If you're not learning doctrine being taught from a dispensational hermeneutic, which includes free grace salvation, pre-tribulation rapture, pre-millennial second coming of Christ, future earthly 1,000 year future kingdom where Christ rules and reigns from Jerusalem, God's separate plan for Israel and his plan for the church, you are being deceived. Uh, and this is true. You're, you're learning uh, false doctrine, you're being deceived, you are learning the doctrine of demons if you're not learning uh, these types of doctrines. True or false, as Christians, we suffer for the sake of Christ because we are his body. Satan can't touch Christ, who's currently in heaven at his Father's right hand, so he attacks Christ's body here on the earth. And as we near the end of the church age, these attacks are going to increase in number and severity. A recent study by uh, Gordon Com Cromwell University shows that nearly 100,000 Christians a year, or one every six minutes, is being martyred. Uh, this is true. I believe it's uh, something like uh, in the last decade, maybe a little longer than that, more, more Christians have been martyred than in the entire 2,000 year period of the, of the uh, church. So uh, Satan is definitely stepping up the uh, plan of attack on the church. Exposition of our verses for this lesson, and as I said, it's this Colossians 2, uh, verses 1 through 7. And uh, Paul says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face. Now, see, he's writing to Colossae, but he also mentions Laodicea and for all those who personally not seen my face. So here's... Here's a little map of the area here. So let's kind of take a closer look at uh, these places. So remember, here's Ephesus, which is where Paul had taught from. Here's Colossae that he's writing to. Here's Laodicea. Remember, Laodicea is one of the churches of the uh, seven churches of Revelation. Um, 
And uh, remember those churches of, of the Revelation included uh, Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis, Philadelphia. Uh, so I think that's all of them. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. So uh, Colossae was not one of the churches of the, Revel of the Revelation, but uh, these uh, churches were in the what was called the Lycus Valley area. So uh, Paul is writing to those churches that he had never been to. He only started the church in Ephesus. He didn't start any of these other ones. So he taught from Ephesus and people would then go out and start these other churches. We know that a man named Epaphras actually uh, started uh, the church there in Laodicea. Uh, other interesting note is here's the Isle of Patmos, which is about 50 miles from Ephesus. That's where Paul wrote, I'm sorry, where John wrote the uh, book of Revelation from. Uh, interesting note there. And uh, also just a note, uh, here's uh, uh, here is uh, Tarsus. Remember, it is Saul of Tarsus. That's Paul's hometown. Antioch was his home church. And uh, you've got about, uh, looks like about 500 miles from his hometown where Paul uh, started from, went to university from. And uh, his ministry basically... Uh, covered most of the southern part of uh, what was called Asia at that point. Uh, if you read the book of First and Second Peter, First and Second Peter actually dealt with uh, Jews that were in this particular area. Paul never went up into that area, but Paul Paul's uh, area did include like right up in here. So he he had all of this kind of area right in through here. And then he went, of course, over into, uh, opened up Europe. Remember from Troas, he goes over to Philippi was his first place. And then he works his way down the coastline, uh, ending up here down in uh, Athens and Corinth and so forth. And then he would go uh, on over into, he would end up over in Rome. But he also, uh, his first uh, journeys were from uh, Antioch over here into Cyprus. And then he went up into this Perga area and uh, these, these little areas right into here. So anyway, just a little quick few interesting notes. Get rid of, get rid of all that. So in case you ever want to use this map. Okay. I think I cleaned that up pretty good. All right. So Paul had not uh, been to or started any of those churches in the uh, Lycus Valley. Those uh, had all been started by and taught by new believers in Ephesus. And uh, these people went back to their cities, started those churches. We know that it was Epaphras who Paul mentions in Colossians 1.7, who was the teacher and founder at the church at Colossae. So the remaining churches mentioned as the seven churches of Revelation, those are shown on that map. Paul didn't visit those churches, nor did he start them. And uh, that's Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Of course, Ephesus makes the seventh. Uh, Paul did start Ephesus, but that was the only one. Now, Timothy taught at Ephesus after Paul left, and later the apostle John will teach at Ephesus. He'll be the sort of the bishop of that area, had several churches under his ministry. Paul would write 1st and 2nd Timothy to encourage Timothy while Timothy was pastoring in Ephesus. And John wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John while he was in Ephesus. And later he would write Revelation from the island of Patmos, as we said, about 50 miles south, uh, actually it's southwest, sorry, south, southwest. Southwest of Ephesus. So um, Paul mentions he has a great struggle for both Colossae and Laodicea and all those who had not seen his face. He explains what he meant by that. His, his struggle is a spiritual one in prayer for them. He hasn't been there uh, physically. So he's got a uh, spiritual struggle going for, for them in prayer. 
and he uses this word agona, which was a place where the Greeks assembled for the Olympic and Pythian games, had their contests of the athletes there. So he's using it as a metaphor. Paul likes athletic metaphors. He was a tiny little guy, uh, apparently not an athlete at all, but he apparently liked uh, those kinds of uh, athletic metaphors. And he's experiencing that kind of a conflict in his, his being, uh, implying a contest of spiritual foes and human adversaries they're facing. So apparently the areas of Colossae, Laodicea, the Lycus Valley, they were just totally infested with these false teachers uh, who were promoting their Gnostic views. And uh, these are false doctrines or doctrines of demons, which are those that are contrary to apostolic doctrine. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Verse two, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Paul desires that the saints in Colossae and all the churches in the area he had not visited, that their hearts be encouraged, having uh, uh, been knit together in love. So that's agape love for one another. That's the love that seeks God's will for that person above everything else. So the idea that the church there would be knit together suggests that this kind of love was needed, especially in light of the false teaching that was causing divisions among the saints in the local church. So Epaphras must have told Paul um, that this was dividing the church, this, this Gnostic teaching, uh, these different doctrines were causing a lot of friction in the church and they really needed to pull together in love and uh, so that's what's happening there. This is true of any local church, as a matter of fact, where false teaching occurs for any period of time. Most of us have had or will have experienced it for ourselves as the church continues into apostasy. Apostasy just means departure from the truth in these last days. Paul writes about this in 1 Timothy, where he says, the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And that's what that means, is it's the departure from apostolic doctrine. Uh, and 2 Timothy 4.3, for the time will come when they won't endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they're gonna accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they're gonna turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside the midst. They don't wanna hear the, you know, the word for word, verse by verse teaching what the scripture says, what did these what did these teachers mean what did the what did the scriptures actually mean what was the original intent of the authors what is god saying They're, they they want to hear what they want to hear and, and they don't want to hear what god has to say it's interesting that uh, you rarely hear these modern day false teachers teach from these uh, later pauline epistles like uh, colossians or ephesians or philippians uh, particularly 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, because that's mature doctrine, specifically for the church age believer. And even the little letter of Jude, which was written specifically to contend for the faith, because the Gnostics had already slipped in and were leading the church astray. That was written about 67, 68 AD. Some say it was even as late as 80 AD that uh, Jude was written. but. In any event, these guys are in, in the churches and they are uh, misleading. They're teaching false doctrine. Instead, uh, the false teachers today, uh, they hang around the Gospels most of the time. If you tune into Daystar, TBN, uh, almost any of these guys will be hanging around the Gospels. And the Gospels, most of which are about Jesus presenting himself to the nation of Israel as their Messiah King, and he's doing signs and miracles to authenticate who he is. Um, if they're Pentecostals, they're gonna hang around the book of Acts, which is the history of the beginnings of the church and its transitions uh, from Judaism. And it too is full of signs and wonders and miracles. A lot of activity of the Holy Spirit, you know, spirit movement uh, to authenticate the gospel and the apostles, 
you know, a lot of the, uh, the gifts of the Spirit are active during that time, healings and tongues and all this kind of stuff, which they really love to latch on to. Uh, it's full of these signs and miracles, which are there to authenticate the gospel and the apostles as the word goes out to the Gentiles. So the gospels in the book of Acts are unusual periods where there's a lot of signs and wonders that take place, whereas most of the Bible doesn't have any activity like that. It's, it's only during short periods of transition where God's bringing one dispensation to a close and introducing a new one that signs and miracles occur. Take your Bible sometime and just flip through it and, and you will see that the majority of the time, probably 90% of your Bible has no signs and miracles at all in it. It's only you know things like the Exodus, uh, Elijah and Elisha. Uh, it's when Christ shows up. Suddenly the demons are real active and there's the casting out of demons. There's a lot of demonology stuff going on during that time. But for the most part, it's sort of business as usual. It's people living life and there, there's no healings. And there's no speaking in tongues and there's none of this stuff going on. So the only other time uh, that you're going to see here in the future where there's a lot of signs and wonders going on is when Satan's man, the Antichrist, comes on the scene during the tribulation. And uh, he's going to deceive many with his ability to mimic signs and wonders as if he's going to save the world. And people are going to be totally deceived by him. So most of the false teaching is going to stay in the Old Testament. Uh, they'll never get much past Acts because they, they, can, they can use the same tricks as the early Judaizers or they can use the clever teaching of the Gnostics, both of which are totally destroyed by the Christian who is really well taught and grounded in the entire Word of God. And they especially know these epistles, especially the later uh, solid teachings of the church, that the doctrine of the church became much more mature and much more documented as we get into the later uh, Pauline epistles, uh, like, like we said, Ephesians, Colossians, and so forth, and how the church is supposed to function, which is really First and Second Timothy and Titus. So we understand the New Testament by first understanding the Old Testament. We really wouldn't have a clue who Jesus is or why he was needed if there wasn't an Old Testament. You wouldn't have any reason to support the nation of Israel today if there was no Old Testament. We wouldn't have any understanding of good, evil, sin, heaven, hell, holiness, atonement, God, God's plan, death, eternal life, coming kingdom, spiritual warfare, so on, without both the Old and the New Testaments. So we would not know that God has a plan for Israel and a plan for the church, and these are separate plans, and that God's plan for Israel is still in place. It's on hold right now, and uh, the church is basically on the scene. But Israel's plan is not over. There's God's unconditional covenants with Israel, which are material, and they're going to be fulfilled in the future earthly kingdom when Christ returns to rule and reign over the entire earth. There's the church, who is Christ's bride, who's destined to rule and reign with him in glory. And these are two different groups of people, one through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and one through a new birth, a birth from above, born again, made into this new creation in Christ. And these are two different groups of people. And if you can't discern that from the reading of the Bible, you don't understand the Bible. Uh, there's not just this one people of God, one plan of God. Paul wants these saints to have results attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. The wealth of the Christian is knowing Christ, having a thorough understanding of God and His Son, knowing God's plan and our part in that plan, and knowing we are sons of God, being secure in having eternal life now, realizing that we're co-inheritors of the future kingdom of God, being totally confident of what is to come in the next life, and having every spiritual blessing available to us now, according to Ephesians 1. We are fabulously wealthy, and we need to understand that. So the health, wealth, and prosperity preachers misuse verses like these in the New Testament, and they most often try to teach the church from the Old Testament, <clears throat> from covenant promises that were made specifically to the nation of Israel under the Mosaic Covenant. 
These promises to Israel were material blessings for obedience to the law. <clears throat> the church is not part of that covenant and not under that law and has no such material promises <clears throat> like those given specifically to the nation of Israel. Ours are spiritual blessings and we already have all of those spiritual blessings available to us per Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. If you're asking God to bless you today, God's got to be saying, what else do you need? I've already given you every blessing available. The wealth that Paul is talking about for Christians comes from gaining more and more knowledge of Christ. <clears throat> Paul's struggle for them is that they would get a true knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ himself. The essence of God's revelation is Christ, according to what Paul wrote in Colossians 1.26. That is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The way you deal with false teaching is to be so full of sound teaching that false teaching is instantly detected and rejected by the saints. The Christians there do not need what the Gnostics are teaching. They need the full knowledge of Christ, which is made known through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God to those who have been saved by grace. Paul says in Ephesians 1.18 that the spiritual eyes of those who are saved have been opened. And we are ready for the Holy Spirit to work with us to illuminate the Word of God as we apply proper study methods. Proper study methods is a whole other subject, but a quick summary is this. Analysis, synthesis, meaning, testing, and application equals loyalty to God. So analysis basically means you use a literal, grammatical, historical, contextual approach to Bible uh, study. Synthesis means you compare Scripture to Scripture. Yeah, scripture can't contradict itself. Meaning um, means that after you've done your analysis and synthesis, that's when you come to the meaning part. And so what we're looking for is the original intent. What did the author mean? And you can only get there by looking at the, it from a literal, grammatical, historical, contextual way and comparing Scripture to Scripture. So then you can get what did the author mean to say, not what do I... You know, what do I think it means to me? What did the author mean? And then you test. <clears throat> After you've done those three steps, then you, you test it. Am I currently in conflict with this truth that I've just found? And if I am, I confess. 1 John 1, 9, because I'm out of fellowship with Christ. If, I'm not, if, I'm, if I hold a different viewpoint, if I have a different truth here, I'm out of fellowship with Christ. And so I confess. 1 John 1, 9. And once I do that, then I apply, which means I repent. I'm going to change my viewpoint. I'm going to start walking in the Spirit, agreeing with the Spirit on this truth going forward. And this leads then to loyalty to God. And this is the whole purpose and goal of our sanctification. It's not to, to stop sinning. Uh, this is a doctrine called perfectionism, which the Methodists believe in. That if, you're, if you work hard enough at this, is that you can become sin-free by the end of your life. That's never going to be possible. But the, the goal is become more and more loyal to Christ. This is the goal of sanctification. Uh, J.B. Hickson right now is doing a How to Study the Bible a course on Wednesday nights. And uh, it's called the Midweek Bible Study of His. And I've given you a link to that. It's, it's really pretty good. It's kind of interactive. And I've, I've enjoyed it. And I've learned some things along the way with that as well. But um, there's a link for you. Uh, verse 4, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive arguments. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Paul tells them that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. It's not in some secret knowledge that only the Gnostics had. Don't let these people delude you. Delude is this uh, Greek word paralogizomai, which means to deceive by false re reasoning. This is what all the cults do to unsuspecting people and even to Christians. Here's some basic issues with Gnosticism and, and this, 
this whole idea of being deceived and deluded. Christianity and Gnosticism are mutually exclusive systems of belief. Gnosticism contradicts what it means to be Christian. It's a dangerous heresy that affected the early church, and it's still around in various forms today. So Gnostics had this doctrine referred to as dualism, and it <clears throat> means that matter is inherently evil, spirit is good. Therefore, anything you do in the body, even the grossest of sins, has no real meaning because real life exists only in the spirit realm. Christianity teaches that we are made in the image of God, body, soul, and spirit. The body of the Christian is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The body belongs to the Lord, was paid for with a price in the atonement. What's done by the Christian, the body is of major importance, and we will be judged by Christ at the Bema Seat. Gnostics claim to possess an elevated knowledge, a higher truth, known only to a certain few. The very word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know. The special knowledge the Gnostics claim to have was not from the Bible, but from some other mystical higher plane of existence. And they considered themselves the privileged class, elevated above everybody else by their higher, deeper knowledge of God. Christianity teaches that the Bible is God's revelation to man. The letter to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 1.1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the word, world. And in Revelation 22.18, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, 15, 17, John 17, 17, Hebrews 4, 12. Other passages that claim that the Bible is our source of God's special revelation to mankind. It's not found in any mystical connections anywhere else, as the Gnostics falsely claimed. Gnostics taught that salvation is gained through the acquisition of divine knowledge, which frees one from the illusions of darkness. The Bible says salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone, not by acquiring special divine knowledge. Additionally, salvation is free. It's available to all who would believe the gospel, not to just some special few who would connect to this mystical divine knowledge. Christianity teaches that there's one source of truth, the Bible. The Gnostics had the heretical writings called the Gnostic Gospels, a collection of forgeries claiming to be the lost books of the Bible. Sounds like A&E or the History Channel today, every year at Christmas or Easter where they come up with some new crazy stuff that's supposed to rock the Christian foundations and challenge the Bible. The early church fathers recognized these as fakes because they knew apostolic doctrine and they could easily detect the errors in the writing. These were written to harmonize the philosophies and practices of the Gnostics, much like the New World Translation Bible does on sections related to Christ for the Jehovah's Witnesses. For example, New American Standard Bible for uh, John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses, their version of the Bible is called the New World Translation, uh, and it reads differently because the Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus is God. Now, get that. They do not believe that Jesus is God. So here's the way they write John 1.1. 1, 1. This is their translation of John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, a little g, God. They believe that Jesus is an emanation from God, a created being. You see how they've rewritten this to <clears throat> support their theology that Jesus is not God. This is how the Gnostics wrote, worked. <clears throat> and they wrote these Gnostic Gospels to support their theology. This is the same thing. 
See, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses have nothing new on this. It's, it's old lies repeated. So this is how the Gnostic Gospels rewrote things to suit their theology and philosophy. The Gnostics believed that Jesus' body was not real. It only seemed to be physical. They taught that his spirit descended on him at his baptism and left him just before his crucifixion. This isn't the Christian view. And it destroys the doctrine of the hypostatic union, the doctrine of the atonement, and the doctrine of the resurrection. If it were true, Gnosticism is based on a mystical, emotional, intuitive, subjective, inward, emotional approach to truth. You know, a lot of Christians, this is where they are because they will not study the Bible. They won't be taught by the Bible. They just want to feel good about Jesus. It goes back to the Garden of Eden where Satan gets Eve to question God. It's the same today. Satan wants people to believe they can find some personal revelation of God. They can connect with the spirit of life. They can meditate, connect with peaceful thoughts or places or spirits. Sounds like yoga to me. Basically, it's anything but God. Christianity is not that. It's revealed truth from the one true God found in the written word. We test everything and we take every thought captive to the word of God. Worship is our response to truth, not emotion. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for the God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. God's given them plenty of information just in things to look around that he has created and then he's given us special revelation through the word of god so man is without excuse he's accumulating the wrath of god against himself for all this false teaching and heresy and flat out denial of truth paul warns these churches do not let these gnostics deceive them with their false reasoning persuasive arguments that are built on the lies of satan himself Learn Christ because in him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He encourages them to stay with their good discipline. Ten toxin, a military term, meaning they are arranged in good order like good soldiers currently. I can see Paul's mind, in Paul's mind, he might be seeing a Roman regiment in battle formation where they are close together, their shields are up, um, ready to take on the enemy. He sees them as a small army under attack and is encouraging them to stay in their formation to hold off the enemy. And because they're standing firmly, they're keeping the faith in Christ and not being misled. It's true that Christians are easily picked off if they get separated from a group of solid believers. And so Paul encourages them to stay in formation. Therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So Paul then concludes from all that he has said in the previous five verses, the Colossians should stay with what they were taught from the beginning. They were taught the person and work of Jesus Christ by Epaphras, who had been taught by Paul. They should stay with this teaching. They should order their behavior accordingly. That is, walk in Him. To walk in Him would be to keep the doctrines they were taught. They'd been rooted in these doctrines so as to be anchored in them. They were now to be being built up in them as part of their present growth. And this all happens within the definitions of in Him, which excludes the need for any Gnostic or Judaizer doctrines. Everything they need is found in Christ. This is where the growth process is established. Faith in Christ. Faith is trusting in Christ. And the more you know about him, the stronger your faith is. And the more trust you develop in the personal relationship with him. We know about him from the teaching of the entire Bible, not from the Gnostics. And in all of this, they are to be overflowing with gratitude to God. Few applications, modern day false teachers generally avoid teaching the epistles, especially the later ones written by Paul. The doctrines taught there don't support what they wanna teach, exposes them to their listeners. Expectations for how the church is to function 
are best defined by 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, not the book of Acts or the Gospels. Gnosticism was becoming prevalent during Paul's day. Warnings being given throughout the epistles are against false teaching, and you, you see it almost through the entire set of the epistles about false teachers, false teaching. It's a warning over and over and over again. Um, false teachings, be it from the Judaizers or Gnostics, but it just seems to continue in the form of people wanting to have their ears tickled today. The number of Christian nominations attest to this, but the Lord hasn't canceled the church over this, but he's allowed it to continue for 2,000 years. To me, it sounds a lot like the nation of Israel who had the Old Testament, but had drifted so far from its teaching uh, as it was written so that when Jesus showed up, they did not recognize him and they did not want him. Is that what's happening with the church? Will there simply be a remnant left by the time the rapture occurs? Question. For those of us who have been exposed to the fundamentals of sound teaching, stay with it. That's Paul's exhortation to the Colossians and a good one for us to remember. Even if you're in a church who does not have it all together, you know what is true and what is false. Stay with what you were taught. Don't allow false teaching to change your walk. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in Him. Stay at the top of your Christian sanctification experience. The Lord is coming soon. See you next week.